Hi, Arrow. Hey, what's going on, Charlie? Not much. Talking about a book that's been up in my head for about a year, so it's I'm having a blast. I was wondering how long you've been holding on to it because now it belongs <laughs> to us. It's it's our turn to sit down and and learn something because you know there haven't been any books about this. Yeah, yeah, I was shocked to find out that no one was working on a book about this. So it was really really cool space to work in. Where did you get all the information? Because I mean, you didn't just sit down and start googling everything or hit Bing or whatever. I mean, because you've really done your homework on this. Yeah, a lot of just a lot of research and a lot of uh, talking to people. Um, yeah, just going back, man, just looking at all the California media. It's all there. The story is all there. And it's just uh, it's so, fu- so funny. I, the signs are all there, too. You know, it's just so great to go back and look at it. I, I always knew of Kamala because Charlemagne de God was the one that kind of introduced me to her because he had her on their show. And so all of a sudden, when, then when I found out that she was running for president, all of a sudden I'm going, oh, my God, I, I, I know about this woman. Yeah, the Charlemagne really did a lot to put her on the national scene. Uh, he even campaigned with her during, yeah, he uh, you know, he had went down to Atlanta with her and had some conversations about, you know, mental health. But wow, you saw you see him now just really depressed about what she's turned into. And, he, and there was that infamous interview that he did with her when she was vice president, where she got mad at him, started jabbing her finger at him. You know, how dare you act like a Republican? Uh, and it really sort of ended that relationship. And Charlemagne is certainly thinking twice before getting on board with another candidate. Dude, I'm, I'm one of those guys. In listening to it, I became a fan. And then on the other side of it, it's like, oh, my God, this we're, we're like reliving Dan Quayle. Yeah, it's interesting that you compare it to Dan Quayle because you, when you have a young vice president, there's a lot of other politically ambitious people out there who are also trying to, you know, sell themselves as a presidential candidate. So I was surprised, you know, going into D.C. and talking to people, just how few Democrats even like her, like, Mm -hmm. and let alone root for her success. They're not they're not pulling for Kamala. Uh, There's so many. uh, Nobody really likes her. I'm shocked. You know, you you think that, you know, there'd be enough Democrats to be like, hey, you know, she's great. Stop being a racist. Stop being a sexist, you know, but. Actually, that's why so many people aren't talking, even though they hold these views. They don't want to sexist and racist for criticizing their historic first right. Right. Uh, vice presidential vice president in, in as they go into 2024. Yeah. The book we're talking about is Amateur Hour. I knew something wasn't right when she couldn't get into the vice presidential house. And, and, and she had to, she waited and waited and waited. And I kept going, that's not how you treat a vice president. Yeah, part of it was because she had some extensive remodeling to do. And so, but yeah, also it it took longer than it should have. And even though they were making significant updates to the kitchen, yeah, she's got a real nice gas stove in there. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, it it, it took longer than it should have. And after reports started trickling out, like why is she still living out of a suitcase out of Blair House? And, And then they finally wrapped up the remodeling job. Wow. Uh, Were you shocked when she said last week that, uh, yeah, I'm afraid of Donald Trump becoming president? No, because she had said that in a couple of interviews before. They've really got her on a tight leash now, very rehearsed talking points. um, And that's what they're selling right now, fear. And if you hear everywhere she goes around the country, she has local media, media interviews, and that's what she's saying. Be afraid. Be very afraid. The boogeyman Trump is coming back, <laughs> and we got to run hard, and we got to run fast, and we got to win. Yeah, I was, I was wondering how they're, they're going to build up that campaign, because in reality, when it comes to the presidential races, it is exciting for this nation. But then you, you look at the other side going, oh, my God, what happens if? Yeah. What happens if Joe Biden can't make it to the election? Somebody mm-hmm. brought it up to Trump just last week and he said, I don't even think he can make it to the election day. Mm-hmm. The party is in a lot of trouble if that happens because Kamala Harris can't step in and compete with Trump. Right. Then you have a very messy problem where you have all different factions trying to pull f- from different candidates, people that they like to replace to replace Biden or replace Harris. But how do you do that without angering a significant portion of your base? You know, the same base that you were trying to win over again in 2020 by picking her as the vice presidential candidate. So it'll be a real mess if he doesn't make it. What was the game plan here in in, in introducing Kamala Harris to this? Because, and is it because Barack Obama came out of nowhere and became a superstar? And then we thought, okay, well, it happened once. It can happen twice. 
Yeah, a huge part. You cannot look at explain Kamala Harris without taking a look at Obama at the yeah. same time. Uh, you know, but as she was rising in the state of California, people were already referring to her as the female Obama or the next Obama. Um, and that's the problem. So many, and especially with, among senators, you have so many senators that got into the, their position, got into the Senate and they're like, oh, I, I'm a senator now. I can be the next president. Obama did it. I can do it. Mm-hmm. How many senators have just run flat into a wall? trying to be the next Obama when it's very clear when you get out there and start talking to voters um, that you're not the next Obama. You just don't have it and voters aren't buying it. And it's, it's, it's very humiliating for someone to go out there and do it. And Kamala Harris did that in Iowa. She dropped out before the Iowa caucus, before voters even had a chance to deliver a verdict. So it was very, it was very humbling for her to sort of experience that. Well, that last election was kind of weird anyway during the primaries because all of a sudden, uh, here comes Biden and he wins the South. And, all, and it's like, what the hell just happened here? Wait, 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 wait. We didn't hear anything from him for a long time. And all of a sudden he wins the South and then goes on and wins the presidency. And I, it was like, I, I don't know what happened here because it happened too quickly. Yeah. Uh, you saw Pete Buttigieg win Iowa, right? He won the Iowa caucus. Mm-hmm. And you saw Bernie Sanders win in New Hampshire. And that's when everybody got real scared because it looked like Bernie might actually win. Yep. And that's when you had all the all the prominent donors. You had Obama calling all the candidates individual. It's time after after you know right before South Carolina after South Carolina they were like okay it's time to leave you have to drop out you have to endorse Biden he's our choice. It's amazing to see how the Democratic Party works the how how powerful the donors are and the senior people in the mm-hmm. party. Well, if I'm a Democrat voter, I, I would be shocked to to even participate in this because it's not up to you. It's up to them. Yeah. 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 What did you learn from doing this? I mean, like you said, you've been holding on to this for a year now. And with all the research that you've got, were you shocked by anything? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I was working as a reporter on, during that campaign, but I was focused more on Pete Buttigieg. So just going back and reliving yeah. those campaign moments, how, realizing how bad her campaign was and how many mistakes she made, how many word salads there were there. Uh, so many attempted reboots of her campaign that failed miserably. She did. She was just totally failing in front of voters, and you know, people just really had a hard time taking her seriously. So yeah, the signs were all there, and you go even further back. You know what was what was her her time like as attorney general, as as the uh, district attorney of San Francisco. All the signs were there. All the same problems. In any sort of scandals, she tried to sweep under the rug as she was just sort of pushing up, escalating her her political career, her political ambition. Uh, was very much there, and she certainly had to convince the donors and the and the money people and yep, the senior people yep. in the party that she deserved her place on that stage. Wow, dude, I can't thank you enough for this book because, like I said before, the, nobody has written a book like this yet, and I love it because I can take my time to read it and digest it. and And I'm just very proud of you for hanging in there. Thanks. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage your listeners to get it. It's a it's a pretty easy read, and you know. So many people know there's something wrong with Kamala Harris, but they don't really know why. And right. this really tells you why. And it'll help you have some some really intelligent conversations going forward. We're going to be having these conversations in the next couple of years, even now as we head into the 2024 election. So I'm really excited for everybody to read it and, and learn a lot about her. Man, you'd be brilliant today, okay? All right. You too, bud.